Hello and welcome to another little making of. This time I'm going to talk about how I made this sequence where I was talking to Shigeru Miyamoto in the Nintendo headquarters in 1984. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. So basically this uh, sequence was made up of three different parts. First the establishing shot with the office building, then me talking and of course Shigeru Miyamoto's reaction shot. When I wrote this here in the script, it was really simple. I didn't think that it would be that hard. It was just fun to write. It's just, yeah, just this little, little segment here. And it just reads, Shigeru Miyamoto nods in excitement. So let me talk you through how I did this chronologically. First up, I started with the establishing shot of the office building. Before anything, there comes research. I researched how Nintendo looked in the 1980s, from the outside, from the inside, how the dress code was. There's a lot of material you can find and even, uh, even found this little uh, photo here of Shigeru Miyamoto in his office attire of the 1980s, smoking in the office. This naughty boy. So for the office building, I thought I'd just find an uh, image of Nintendo R&D 1. That's the place where uh, Super Mario Bros. was developed. And yeah, and just make some 3D uh, building out of it for a little establishing shot. Turns out nobody really knows where this building is or I didn't find it. I s went uh, on all the forums and asked questions, but <laughs> I didn't get a single answer of where this building was. So I had to make up something uh, uh, myself. In my research about this Nintendo office, I also found this here. This is the Nintendo headquarter, uh, not in Kyoto, but in Tokyo. Today it still looks probably like it looked in the 80s with this just drab <laughs> concrete facade and this cheesy uh, blue-white Nintendo logo on top. But I couldn't use it, uh, the image from, from Google Street View. Thankfully, here in Salzburg, there is this one office building who looks like it belongs to the same era of, of the 1980s and looks equally horrid on the outside. One day I drove up to it and filmed it with this little cheap yeah, camcorder, which I used to uh, shoot all my little uh, Let's Play videos. Uh, the good thing about this is uh, it, it produces a handheld video, especially if you, if you hold it like this. And I also used, used the zoom here in the beginning just to make it look like, yeah, this was some home video from the 1980s. But as it is obvious, this building needed a lot of cleanups in the final shot. There was this signage on top and these billboards. And yeah, even the surroundings didn't, didn't look this like this urban uh, Kyoto or urban Tokyo. So I had to get creative. First, I just cleaned the image. I tracked the whole shot in Mocha and yeah, just applied my cleanups, which is a project in itself. And then for the background, well, I needed, as I said, something that looked more urban than what was there. On Google Street View from the Nintendo headquarters in Tokyo, I just cruised down some blocks on the road and lo and behold, it looked pretty urban, right? And it was the same street that the building was on. So I just positioned my camera in street view there to roughly match the perspective of my shot. And yeah, just painted it in, 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 in Photoshop and threw it on and, and tracked everything. So now I had the building cleaned up and the background. The last thing for this shot I tackled was this block with the Nintendo logo. At first I thought, yeah, I should probably do this in Maya because I really know my way around Maya. But then I thought, yeah, I mean, it's just it's just a cube with, with a texture on, right? I mean, I can do this in Photoshop with just the, the Photoshop 3D. <laughs> yeah, Photoshop uh, 3D is it's not the best thing to make 3D. It's like the Photoshop uh, animation timeline. It's, it's, it's really clunky. But in the end, I stuck to it. Of course, it would have been much faster in Maya. Yeah, but in the end, it worked out. It looked reasonable enough. And then I rendered it out and painted on some little dirt and, and just some chipped off paint. You, you probably don't see it, but, but you feel it just to make it, to make it look more real. And yeah, and then I just put everything into After Effects, tracked it on and rendered it out. And this was pretty much the establishing shot. And then, of course, the script says, Miyamoto not in excitement. <laughs> so where the hell do I get a video of Miyamoto not in, in, in excitement? I thought I'd maybe use a photo of him in South Park style animation. 
but yeah, that wouldn't uh, wouldn't really fit in. And then, uh, while I was researching Nintendo, I came across this video here, uh, which was a promotional video of the then, uh, then new Mario Maker. And in the beginning, it had this little snippet from a documentary, apparently from the 80s, where it is Shigeru Miyamoto himself talking you through how they were making the Super Mario Bros. 3, I think it was in the video. So yeah, there I had my authentic video of Miyamoto in the 80s. I had struck gold. But the problem is he was talking all the time and for a re reaction shot I really needed a, a silent Miyamoto. So <laughs> I had to digitally shut him up. Sorry, Shigeru. The snippet that I had from this promotional video, I imported it into After Effects and selected a range where he wouldn't move his head around this much as he was talking. Then I went through the whole video and selected a frame where he had his mouth closed, so that it looks like he wasn't talking all the time. I tracked his head movement in this range and just cut out the, the image where he wasn't talking, used the still frame of this and just slapped it on top and had this patch and it would move with Shigeru Miyamoto's head. So there I had him silent. If you watch closely, you can see that it's still some movement here in the eyes because of course he, he was talking underneath this, this, little, this little still frame. But yeah, in principle it was just <laughs> slap a still frame of him not talking on top. The next problem I had uh, was uh, the time code. You see in this whole uh, segment there, there was just this burned in time code. Of course this wouldn't work. I just scrubbed through the whole video, just trying to peek uh, uh, behind the time code where his tie would show up so I knew where the knot of his tie was and everything. And yeah, just, just bits and pieces there. And in Photoshop I just painted it and slapped it together and essentially just tracked it on there manually myself because he was turning a little bit and moving so... And this was the first time that I'm really happy that I'm working with old crappy VHS footage because yeah, my manual adjustments just really don't, don't match up that, that well and I was low on time already so I just wanted to get it done. And again, it's not perfect, but because the whole image is so jittery, it kind of works if you're not paying close attention to it. And then lastly, I was missing from this whole sequence. So I knew from my research already about the dress code uh, at Nintendo at the time, so it wasn't really that hard finding a white shirt and a, and, a, and a black tie. And I thought my character to be some kind of middle management, he doesn't really know what the programmers, all these nerds are doing and he's not that really that fluent in Japanese or something, but he considers himself a little bit cooler than all those nerds. But you can't deviate from the dress code, and so how to communicate this? With glasses. For this Ludum Dare, I bought a, a bunch of novelty glasses in a way, it's just, I think it's just clear window glass. Yeah, I got this little 70s hippies glasses, which I don't need, but maybe in the future. Then these uh, 50s nerd glasses, which I put on when I was uh, doing this Tolkien bit. And of course, these red 1980s aviator glasses. So just perfect for this guy, middle manager who thinks he's really cool. Then I, it was of course a green screen shoot. And here in my home office, it, the space is much too cramped. I moved to our living room and just relocated our dining table and did some set dressing with some office supplies from, from my home office. The reason why I went there was so that I could prop up the green screen behind me with enough space so that I wouldn't cast any shadows. The lighting essentially was, was pretty simple, it was just one light uh, bouncing from the top just like in the, in, the, in the reaction shot of Miyamoto, it's just some very cheap office lighting. Because my guess is Nintendo always had their blinds closed because everyone was working <laughs> on computer terminals anyway. Yeah, about the set dressing, what you see on the table is of course office supplies, but then I wanted something to match the time period and the location perfectly. And thankfully, I have a little bit of, of Nintendo stuff in our little video game museum. Of course, I needed to have the original 1980s Nintendo Famicom there on the desk, so this is what's on the front here. Then I had this little two-player Game & Watch, which is a, yeah, it's, it's, it's quite interesting and I don't think you see it that often. And the other thing that I had there was another Game & Watch, the Donkey Kong two-screen Game & Watch.
When I'm acting or making a little scene, I always want to have a little bit of backstory just, just for myself, for the characters. And in this case, uh, this is where the Donkey Kong Game & Watch comes in. Because I thought yeah, it, it was like this. Uh, this. This guy, me in the 80s, was playing Donkey Kong on this Game & Watch and then suddenly Miyamoto walked in with this strange, strange concept and I just put it down and, and just took, took the papers from Miyamoto while he was sitting there and just read through them and then I said, so let me recap. This is why there's a Game & Watch just sitting right there next to me. So in the final shot, of course, the green screen, as you can see, is not wide enough, which is of course fine, because in the end the aspect ratio was 4 by 3, because this whole widescreen thingy for home video wasn't invented, I think, until the mid-1990s for consumers, so it was fine, I would cut uh, those off right away. Then, of course, I had the problem of finding an authentic or rather plausible background for Nintendo in the 1980s. I looked at a lot of stock photos, but it's really hard coming by stock photos from tech companies from the 1980s, which also matched the perspective of the shot. And that was close to giving up and just, yeah, staging the whole scene in front of a boring white wall, maybe with, with some, some drawers. But in the end, uh, in my research, I came across an interview with the set designer from this, this uh, show Halt and Catch Fire, which is a really interesting show. Uh, and it's also set in the 1980s. And there were some photographs of just the sets. And there was also this pic of the Cardiff Electric set without any actors or anyone in them. It's just a straight on shot. So I thought, yeah, this, this looks, looks, looks good. All the, the perspective almost matches. I just have to scale it up. Problem is, it wasn't really that big of an image. I mean, it, I think it was just 450 pixels high and for HD, I really had to scale it up. But even if you make it blurry and with all VHS treatment, yeah, it still uh, would be lacking in detail. So I thought, yeah, how can I make this bigger? Well, I found this website, it's called Waifu something, and it was apparently meant to scale up your anime avatars. Either way, it also works with photographs, and this is what I did. I just scaled it up twice the size and it looked, it looked really good. And then I had it in Photoshop and could start with the cleanups. Of course, since it was from, from this show, Hold and Catch Fire, I had to get rid of all these flags of Texas and all the English text and just uh, replace them with, uh, I think it was Donkey Kong Jr. Uh, advertisements in Japanese. Because at this time, uh, uh, there hadn't been Super Mario Bros. invented. Because, yeah, this is the whole point of the bit, right? So I had this in the background. And then there was, uh, when I tried it out the first time, there was this big office plant uh, in the background, right where I had my head. And the problem was with the green screen and the keying, I had this white fringe, which uh, was roughly the color of, of the wall. But against this pretty dark uh, office plant, it, it really gave away that there was just some green screen keying uh, happening. So yeah, back to Photoshop and I just painted out this, this whole office plant. The last thing was, was real fun, because here in the front you can see this little, little desk plate with my name on it, also in Japanese. Actually, that's, that's my real name in Japanese there, because my last name translates to Ray or Beam, and this is just what's, what's on it, in, just in Japanese. I also did this in the Photoshop uh, 3D space. Why was I torturing myself? <laughs> but yeah, for this, and it was kind of blurry, it, it, it worked out. And so this is how I made this shot. A, a Goomba. So now I had all my visuals together, but I needed also matching sound. And since I was short on time, I couldn't just go out and record all that stuff that I needed. So I went to SoundSnap once again, just throw in some money and of course found something. Uh, for the establishing shot, I found some original Tokyo ambience. And for the office, I found some great office sound without any kind of, of new technology, like, like cell phones uh, chirping or something, which was really nice. And I just, yeah, just tried it out, threw it on there. And <laughs> as, as I just was playing back for the first time with the office uh, ambience, I just wanted to see if it worked. And there was just some guy coughing right with the reaction shot of, of Miyamoto. <coughs> And I found this hilarious. So I thought, yeah, this, this is some great uh, accidental comedy. So of course it had to stay in there. So how did I arrive at this grungy VHS look? 
Well, it's an other rather authentic VHS look. You see, from the money from my very first summer job, I bought uh, this SVHS VCR and I still have it around and sometimes I route through a, a console signal to display it on the flat screen. And I also had this uh, VHS tape still in there and I thought, yeah, just record this bit here onto this tape and it's gonna be fine. Just wanted to see what was on the tape, so I hit play and the recorder made an ugly sound and it was really not good. And I hit stop and, and eject. And since the tape was in there like three years without any playback or something, somehow it just got tangled up. And I really had to jerk it out there and it was just a tangled mess. And it was the only VHS tape that I still have. So yeah, I needed to fix it. And it was a long night. I just took the VHS tape apart and wound up the spools where the tape itself wasn't all wrinkled up. So it would work again. Just, just put it back together and slipped it back into the VCR. And thankfully it worked. And for the first time I could see what the hell was still on this tape. And it was a playthrough of Hammering Harry on the NES I had recorded ages ago. So I just needed to record this uh, whole bit with Miyamoto. And I did this the following way. I bought this little uh, piece here, which is an HDMI to analog uh, downscaler, essentially. So uh, I had this uh, HDMI cable from my notebook that went straight into this HDMI to cinch downscaler. And from there, I had these cinch cables which ran into my video recorder. And from the video recorder I had this SCART to cinch which ran into my TV just to see what I was actually recording. And it worked well. I had no problems there whatsoever recording it onto the VHS. And I thought, yeah, this was easier than expected. And once I tried to get what was on the VHS now back into the computer, this is where things got ugly. <laughs> The plan was real simple. From my VCR, I, I would output uh, via SCART uh, the analog signal, plug it into the cinch connections on this uh, HDMI upscaler. It just takes in some analog cinch signal like from an old gaming console and outputs an HDMI signal, which I use uh, to play uh, Super Nintendo games on my flat screen. But instead of going to the TV, it would go to my portable pocket recorder, which I use to record HDMI games from my consoles which itself connects to my notebook via USB. And there on the notebook, it has this own little software where I can record stuff as MP4. That was the plan. However, it didn't work. And I spent half the night just trying to find out where the problem was. Turns out it was the HDMI upscaler. It works fine if you just display it on the TV, but if you have an HDMI signal coming out that you pop into the, the, the pocket recorder, it's just black. It, it just never worked. And I was close to just calling it a day. But then I remembered from old times, I still had this little, what uh, it was called an easy grabber, which yeah, it just takes in uh, a cinch analog signal and plugs into your uh, notebook's USB port. And you can record there just some uh, analog stuff. And this was just great. So from my VCR, from the SCART cable, I plugged in all, in all the cinch connections into the easy grabber, the easy grabber to USB into my notebook, and it worked. Kinda. The video worked. At least it was something, right? And I could record it with this VLC player, but for some reason the audio didn't work. And so I was there sitting on the floor in the living room late at night, bunch of cables all around me, just going from forum to forum trying to find out why the hell isn't this working with my audio and try different drivers and yeah. In the end I just gave up and found a different way to record the audio. So this is how I did it. From the VCR there is this SCART output and from it via cinch I plug the video signal into the easy grabber and this easy grabber signal goes into my computer via USB. This was the video signal. For the audio, I used this cable here, which is a cinch cable to the line jack, and I plugged this one into my line in on the notebook for recording the line signal. So I had the video coming in via USB and the audio coming in via line, and it worked. Kinda. <laughs> when I tried to record it, it was just horribly out of sync. Like, I think it was two seconds the audio and video completely whack. 
And I thought at this point, I had spent like five hours with this whole process. And I thought, ah, just screw it. I will, I will do the, the syncing in my editing program. And that's just what I did. So <laughs> but this is probably a bit too long and way too uninteresting for you. But I'm just recording this for myself in case I should ever have to do this setup all over again. Jesus. So now I had this genuine VHS thing back in my computer and just threw it in the edit, put on my headphones and watched it and, and, and listened to it the first time. And while it looked great, it really had this authentic VHS look. Of course it had. The sound was, <laughs> it was way too good. I don't know how my VHS recorder did this, but, but the sound was almost like CD quality. It, it was really, it was unsettling almost. But I wanted this muffled, grungy, yeah, late 80s, early 80s VHS sound. So I did it like I did it with the Super Ludum Dare uh, arcade cabinet, which was find a reference of how I want it to sound, then mess up my own audio. The reference I found was this tutorial series that was on that came out on VHS tapes in the early 80s of how to program your Commodore 64. Hello, my name is Jim Butterfield, and I'd like to tell you about the Commodore 64. So I threw it into Reaper and looked at its uh, waveform and its spectrum. And with a lot of equalizers and tube compressors, I managed that my audio from, from my VHS sounded like, like this early 1980s VHS sound. Everything in the edit and it was done. So let me recap. You're playing a plumber that stomps on turtles to jump high enough to bump his head on floating bricks. And there you have it. This is all it took for this final sequence and I probably think it was way too much effort for this just little throwaway bit. But at the same time, if you thought even for a second, wait, this looks authentic, then I had you and it was worth all the effort. So I hope this was uh, entertaining or interesting and I hope that you learned just one thing and that is trying to get your VHS signal back into the computer yeah, yeah, you invite yourself into a world of pain. Yeah, thanks for watching. See you around.